Before we dive into our conversation today with Melvin Varghese, we want to remind you that Revision, Explore Your Stories, Shape Your Future is coming up this August. It's the very first Practice of Being Seen retreat, and it's going to be an amazing experience for therapist healers. Learn more at practiceofbeingseen.com slash events. The Practice of Being Seen is about understanding who you really are and daring to share your truth with the world. This is a conversation with and for seekers, creators, and holders of transformation. We believe that stories shape relationships, and relationships shape stories. This is Rebecca Wong, relationship therapist and founder of Connectfulness. And this is Marisa Gowdy, writer and storytelling coach for healers. And this is The Practice of Being Seen. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Today's guest is Melvin Varghese, a PhD who is a licensed psychologist in private practice in Philadelphia, where he helps entrepreneurs and basketball players achieve peak mental performance. He's also the founder of the top-ranked Selling the Couch podcast, which helps aspiring and current private practitioners build successful practices, create multiple streams of income, and build a business focused on family and self-care. In 2015, he founded the Healthcasters, a community for health, wellness, and fitness podcasters. And we just happen to be members. <laughs> Welcome, Melvin. Uh, it's so good to be here, connected. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. We are so happy to have you. And I'm just going to apologize to you and to our listeners that I'm getting over a little bit of bronchitis. And so my voice is not quite my normal voice. But we are so happy to be here and be talking to you today, Melvin. Again, just honored to be here, Rebecca. I'm I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, you sound you sound fine. So <laughs> good, thank you. <laughs> so we know that you launched Selling the Couch. I think it was March 2015. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so in the past two years, you're now in like the top one percent of downloads, a downloaded podcasts, or something like that. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been quite a journey. It is now in the top one uh, percent. You're getting how many downloads a month now? Did I read it was like over fifteen thousand downloads a month? Yeah, so it's been steadily increasing. So fifteen thousand, I think, uh, last month we had almost eighteen thousand. Hmm. So you know, as we talk about that, and we know that that's just like that's a two year, maybe a little over two year span. Hmm. There's so much growth and being seen that is happening in that amount of time. And I would love to have an opportunity today to dive in with you a little bit around just what that process, the internal process has been for you to kind of navigate and manage, um, what I imagine would be a lot of fears and insecurities around being seen. Um, and just kind of really letting yourself kind of show up in a really authentic way, which you do. Yeah, I think that part, the internal fears and struggles, I mean, I often tell folks, like, there's nothing like launching a podcast to bring <laughs> up all of our insecurities. But at the same time, I have no regrets about it because there's just something so powerful uh, when you do take a risk that absolutely terrifies you. In some ways, you feel like, can you do this? This is going to be the end of the world if it doesn't work. But then when you get to the other side, I don't know, there's this weird sense of peace. And, and we can definitely talk more about this. But like, I found myself like much more courageous than I've ever been, I think, in, in my life. I think traditionally, I've always been a um, kind of an aim, 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 never fire kind of person, you know, uh, mainly because I think I don't know. I, I, looking back, I think it was just, I've let a lot of fear, I think, dictate my life. And I think once you cross something that, that scares you, um, maybe it doesn't work out exactly the way you envision, but I think just taking, having that, that bold courage to take that step, I think there's just something very powerful in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking too, in some of your work outside of podcasting, you work with basketball players, right? Absolutely. And you help them perform better. And yeah. as you're talking about this, you know, taking this aim, aim, aim and never fireplace, I'm thinking about the references there and just kind of how, how does that cross over with sports psychology and performance? And, you know, there's, there's so many crossovers here and that's kind of what I'm hearing. I'm just kind of leaning into that a little bit more. And I guess I just want 
to open up a door and ask you to to muse on that with us for a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think more recently when I've been working with uh, some of the players, we've actually been focusing a lot on the free throw, right? It just seems like such a small aspect of the entire game. But for me, I feel like that's the most important shot in the game because one, I think uh, it's such a unique spot where you're at this free throw line, everyone is staring at you and all you have are your own doubts and insecurities with you. And here you are trying to contain them all the while trying to not tense up, but but take the free throw, right? And I just think that is such a, I don't know, such a beautiful image, I think, of what it what it is when we step outside of our comfort zone, right? Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's why I like working with basketball players. Uh, I think besides the fact of, you know, being an immigrant in this country and I think basketball was one of the ways that I fit in, you know, and kind of found my own identity. You know, I'm just loving here as being, you know, I wouldn't know what to do with a basketball if it hit me in the head. <laughs> and, you know, American born, a woman without any, any connection to these exact stories. There's a universality in this. And it's certainly I can reflect to you that my own experience in podcasting and business building has very much been about, as you say, that aim, 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 never fire. But I never would have articulated it to myself in quite that way. Mm. Um, but I just want to just, you know, in knowing that the universal is found in the specific, as you're sharing this experience of standing at a free, free throw, th- I can't even say it, free throw line. I haven't stood at one of those since I was 13. Um, I think we're all standing there with you and we all are thinking about what our own basketball looks like. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I never actually visualized it as the basketball, right? Because for all of us, we do have a basketball in our life and maybe multiple ones. Mm. Um, and I don't know. It's like, how do we, and I think especially for us helpers and healers, I think so many of us are just so intellectually gifted, right? And I think in some ways that's our double-edged sword because the ability to think outside the box is also sometimes the thing that stops us from actually taking action because we can just say, oh, I I need to think about it this way or that way. And, but we actually never do. It's that action taking. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I know Maurice and I were leaning into this podcast for quite a long time. We had the visions there. And if we hadn't had the support of your health casters program, we probably would still be just leaning into it and thinking about it or have let it go. So there's something about that supportive community also and connecting with people who have gone the road before you, um, who have made that free throw that really helps to get outside of your head, I think a little bit. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's this old African proverb that hangs on my wall and it's, uh, alone, we go faster together, we go further. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just guided a lot of how I try to see, you know, both selling the couch, health casters, and just life in general, you know, I think, and to be honest, this is a, it's a struggle for me because I'm a very independent person. I don't like, I don't like to delegate things. I, I like to try to do things on my own. And the fact of just realizing that I can get a lot further and, and learn and support and all of those things for doing things together is just, It's been, I think, in some ways, very liberating for me, hard, but liberating for me. You know, as I'm hearing this too, as we're thinking about, you know, the helping professionals and the healing professionals, there's that, and and on this podcast, we often talk about, you know, the dance of the masculine and feminine and that concept of the doing and the holding. And as you're thinking, and that's been a big part of my own journey right now in terms of when do I do and when do I hold? And as Rebecca's saying, how long we could have leaned into the idea of the podcast and holding the vision, there's that next step of executing the vision and figuring out how to keep moving and holding at the same time. And I'm thinking about, you know, moving further together and that image of perhaps holding hands as moving forward and how that holding works in that, in that way. Yeah, no, I think that's such an apps, like such a beautiful image. Uh, I think one of the things that I just kept telling myself, uh, and I constantly have to remind myself every time I take on a new project, um, is, you know, you don't have to get it right. Just get it going. Right. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I constantly have to <laughs> remind myself of this because I think for me, it's like I want to plan 10 steps ahead and I want to envision what all of this is going to look like, right? With, I mean, I think selling the couch is the perfect example of this because frankly, I had no idea all of this would happen, right? Like the way it's grown, I mean, the community and all of that. But I think the idea for selling the couch literally came in the shower. I sat on it for five months because I was terrified. And I said, you know, I doubted myself. And I said, who are you to be able to do something like this? There are so many other people in the field doing all sorts of things. I mean, you're just, you know, you're two years licensed, you know, um, and who are you? And I think a lot of times I think, I mean, yeah, those five months, that was actually my real struggle. It wasn't the idea itself. It was, uh, fighting my own demons and trying to, and trying to walk with them. Can you walk us through that a little bit more? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, (laughs) I'm going to probably get emotional now, but I think, when I first had the idea of selling the couch, uh, it, it came out of two events. Um, one was uh, I would meet with two other um, friends who were in the field. We were all trying to start in solo practices, and we would have these conversations. Uh, once a month, we would grab a meal together and try to just learn about how to build a private practice. Uh, and the second thing is I was in the group practice, and... I realized, uh, one, I was, you know, working a couple of late nights. We had just gotten a blizzard here in the Northeast. Um, I ended up having to cancel a couple of days worth of clients because we had almost, I think, a little over 40 inches of snow. I grew up in Texas, so anything above an inch and a half is way too much, you know? Uh, and I just remember, like, feeling so, like, you know, all this income. We were saving up for the down payment on our home the selling the couch idea came in during that time. And I just remember a lot of nights where, I mean, I would be in panic. I I would cry myself. Uh, My wife would be like, what's wrong? You know? And I would just, I would, you know, it's, I don't know. It's when you feel like you have this idea and yet it terrifies you. Right. But what do you do? Mm. Right. And I think that's the space I was in. And, you know, I know for some, for myself, often when these ideas start showing up, there's often a a space that they have to grow into. They have to Mm. mature. Mm. Um, They don't come, the first seeds of them don't come fully formed and ready. Mm. And so there's, there's a space of kind of sensing them and holding them before we birth them. Mm. And I'm, I'm curious what that process was like for you and who the people um, who the relationships that you had in your life, um, who the people were that, that kind of helped you hold that space. Yeah, no, it's such a, a, it's such a great way of looking at it. Um, I would say the people that most impacted me were, um, definitely my wife, because I think she, she sees me at a, at a very different level than, you know, most folks see me. Right. And she was the one who said, you know what, this is such a great idea. I know that a lot of your field, she's not in the field, but she knew that a lot of the, my field struggled with this. And she said it was a good idea. And she kept saying, you know what, the worst thing is like, this doesn't work out. And we just go back to our, our lives, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think she's a very practical person. <laughs> and for me, like, I think it just felt like this weighty, like emotional thing, right? Like, this will be the end of the world and my career as we know it, right? And, uh, I don't know, for her to say that, I think it was just so grounding for me. Um, my brother and my parents have played a big role in my life. Um, I don't know if we'll get time to talk a lot about this, but my parents um, both gave up careers. My my parent, we lived in India. I was actually born there. And um, my dad was a lawyer in India, a young and upcoming one. And my mom was a nurse in Saudi Arabia. Um, she decided to work in Saudi Arabia because... Um, there just weren't too many employment opportunities in India. So my parents would literally see each other a couple of times a year. And wow. they made this really crazy decision to immigrate to the U.S. I think they had been uh, putting it off uh, for almost a decade. And it was kind of like a last chance in, in the late 80s. 
And I had just finished the first grade. And so my parents said, okay, we're going to pack up and move. And uh, I didn't speak the language, uh, you know. uh, But you were all together. Yeah. My dad and I were together. So my mom actually had to finish uh, one more year working. And I have a younger brother. And he was actually, uh, when he was born, he lived in India with my grandparents for a while. So we were all separated for a couple of years. And uh, Mm. and then we were finally together in 91. Oh, wow. Yeah. (sighs) So, so it's, I mean, it's re- that uh, there, I'm hearing in there too, in, in your story, there's, you know, there's, there's the seed there too. There's mm-hmm. the, we want to all be together kind of story. Right. And then there's the, there's the process of what does it take to get there and what's the work, you mm-hmm. know, there's, there's a foundation for, for just kind of holding that whole process and mm-hmm. talk about fears and insecurities showing up around, mm-hmm. around yeah. it all. I'm just, I'm, I'm imagining myself in your story and. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, that's absolutely right. I think for me, like it was also a way to honor my parents starting Mm -hmm. selling the couch because I mean, the courage it takes someone to leave all they know behind, right. And to start life over, um, when you're an adult, right. I I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do this, um, because that's what they did and to a much larger scale, right. And, uh, I don't know, it was, I think there's that Steve Jobs quote, which I'll butcher, but, you know, he talked about in that Stanford commencement where the things that he was learning in the moment didn't make sense to him. But when looking back, you know, they were like perfect, right? Like they perfectly lined up, right? Like he learned, I don't know, typography in undergrad or took a college class in typography. He had no idea, but it later it formed the fonts for the Mac, right? And I think mm-hmm. I look back, uh, definitely not on the Steve Jobs level, but uh, I look back at my life and I'm like, you know, this is, this really is like, it hasn't been an easy journey. It hasn't always been a straight journey, but um, it has been a wonderful journey. And the things that I picked up, you know, from my parents, resilience and courage and uh, the willingness to sacrifice. So my father's first job here in the U.S. was actually in the shipping department at Walmart. And so here you have a, an attorney who comes to the U.S., um, doesn't have his law degree now. And so he worked there and uh, put himself through law school. And, uh, you know, and my mom worked the night shift, 12 hour shifts. And then so that uh, she would be present when my brother and I came back from school. And I think all of this was just to, I think, honor them. Uh, And I'm I'm just so, I'm grateful for the journey, even though it's been hard. You know, especially in, in the way our country is right now, Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really appreciating hearing your story and the rooting in of just the, the immigrant lines and and your own lineage and knowing Mm -hmm. kind of how you, how you came here and how that roots you in to this life that you're building now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, I just, I don't know if selling the couch would have existed, you know, (laughs) but I think I am just, I'm so grateful that, you know, we do live in a country, uh, even though there is a lot of uncertainty and turmoil and all of those things, uh, where we, you know, where we do still live in a country where we can, um, I think be free to hopefully explore who we are and, and figure things out. I think that's the key of it all, right? Mm. The living in uncertainty and being free to explore who we are and figure it all out. Like, mm. And the way I'm thinking about that is we hear, you know, Melvin's family story. We're thinking about what's happening in our country overall. We're thinking about the private practice journey. journey. Mm. It's so much that pairing of what the heart wants and what the heart yearns for. Mm. And it's those practicalities and structures. And well, this is the way the world is. And I think, I just, I, I feel that at, I think we feel that at so many levels and so many. your story really opens that up in a whole, even more vivid way. Mm. Uh, no, thank you for allowing me to share it. I think the other I think the other big piece is uh, we don't have children now, but I, uh, you know, if, if we are blessed with children, I think I want to tell my kids that I I took a risk and I did something that absolutely scared me, you know, <laughs> and uh, but dad still took a risk, you know, and look what look what happened, 
you know, because uh, hopefully I can encourage them, you know, to, to not always be safe and, and to take the, the path that's easy and comfortable. <sighs> I'm just really breathing into that. I've got all the shivers yeah, right now. All the shivers. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing you so deeply there, Melvin, and I, I want to reflect and repeat those words that you just said, because they're, these are words that I want to bring home to my family to teach them and to encourage them that you don't always have to take the path that's safe, that there's merit in that, in that uncomfortable place too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I just, I realize it more and more. I think that's really where the, the magic happens, you know, is in that space of right at the edge of where we're comfortable and, and then the edge of where it terrifies us. Oh, Yes. And I'm coming back to the relationships and the way we get held as you were you know, telling the story of, of your wife pretty much saying, well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We just move on. And, <laughs> you know, I, I know, I think a lot of relationships work that way where one of us is, you know, on, on the edge and saying, oh my gosh, can I, can I? And there's that person beside you that says, yes, you can. And if you don't, it's going to be okay. We'll find a new way. I've got you. I'm holding you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, I think, a blessing to have people like that, right? Whether it's a spouse or a close friend or whoever it is, right? A significant other. Oh, um, it is, it, yeah. A colleague, a, mm-hmm, a neighbor. Yeah. You know, one of the, the taglines for our podcast is that stories shape relationships and that relationships shape stories. And... I think this story is a really great illustration of the intersection between how, like how your story is so deeply affected and held by the relationship between you and your wife. Yeah. Um, she's my, uh, she's my rock, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think she's really the unspoken hero in all of this because There's just no logical reason why a scaredy cat like me should be doing things like this, you know? (laughs) Can can we get you to put on another hat for a minute? Is that okay? Of course. So you just said there's no logical reason why a scaredy cat like you should be doing any of this. And yet I know that when you work as a consultant, that's exactly one of the places that you lean into with the with the professionals and the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know as a, as a therapist that very often my own healing journey is a big part of also the work that I help other people with and that I hold them in. Um, the lessons that I learn are so applicable to the work that I do. And I'm thinking that you have a lot to offer us there too. And around, how to, how to sit and own those fears and insecurities, how to grow into those places and how to just live in that uncertainty in that, in that space. And how to use it in your work yeah. as you're yeah. helping to guide others. Yeah. You no, know, it's such a, a great question. I, Rebecca Marissa, like, I think one thing I've realized is, uh, everyone has fears and insecurities, right? Um, And I think for a long time, I just kept thinking the people that were doing these amazing things, they, they didn't have those, right. Or somehow they had conquered them. And I think what I realized is it's not the presence or it's not the intensity of the fear, but it's what we do despite that. Right. Um, and I think that's where, um, I think that's where I guess the growth is. And that's where I try to focus on. I mean, even at a practical level next week, I'm, uh, we have a local meetup of therapists in private practice here in Philly. And, um, the, the, oh, the, the person who, um, started the meetup was like, can you lead one? Can you lead a table next week? Two years ago, I would have been like, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll be a <laughs> part of the table, but you know, uh, but we're, you know, I'm leading this table and, and I'm, of course I'm scared and, you know, I'm, I'm nervous and, uh, like, you know, I'm a lot of the insecurities I'm sure will come up. But I think one thing that's been helpful for me is 
And I always try to say some version of this, like when I go into these situations, I, I just say, just Melvin, just come from a heart of service, you know, um, mm -hmm. come from a place of giving. Um, and as long as you do that, you know, uh, that's what matters, right? It's not, it's not the other stuff like income and all of that stuff. I think is a, I, I realize it's income and influence is a byproduct of service. And I think for a long time, I thought it was the other way that, you know, somehow I had to create income and create the influence and, and then service could be sort of a side thing, you know, related to that. You know, it's interesting as you mentioned service. I have a little dance with that term sometimes. And I mm. notice that oftentimes some of my writing clients do too, mm. especially in the therapy community when sometimes they say, oh gosh, being of service, you know, mm. and it's often from parents who are, you know, at home and supporting families and, and doing all the things and then going into their office and, and holding so much space for those who, who need them. Mm. And there's, it can be a, a tricky, sticky word. And as you describe it, you know, come from a heart of service that makes it into what sounds more like, you know, even a sacred act and something that's very rooted into how you see yourself in this world and what you're meant to do. And I'm just wondering if you've ever encountered any kind of sticky points around the idea of service, either in your own work or in those you're working with. Yeah. I mean, I think one, well, a practical level, I think sometimes what I struggle with is, uh, do I give too much away? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, do I, uh, am I, are people going to take advantage of me? Um, yeah, I would say those are probably <laughs> the two big things that really, you know, um, and, and you do lead with a lot of service and you do give a lot. So I, I hear where those, those stories come from. And yet I also feel like that's where people get to know you and get to see you and get to trust you mm. and why people want more from you. Mm. Not, not as in give me, give me more, but like they want to, to engage with you more. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, like, thank you for saying that. I, I think I've just, I've learned that people connect with people, you know, yes. <laughs> right? Like people don't connect with websites and you know, and Instagram and all that, you know, and I think sometimes like think in this kind of crazy world, we, we forget that. You know, I was on your website before we, we called you up today. Mm -hmm. And when I landed on your homepage, I just like, I turned to Marisa and I just like took a deep breath and I was like, it's just like, I just landed. Like I just landed on Melvin mm -hmm. because your homepage is, it's not confusing. There's not all this different information like I saw a picture of you and I was like, hi, I'm here. Mm. Yeah. So speaking of people, people connect with people. You pulled that off really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd ever even thought of it. You know, like I think it just felt like the human thing to do, right? Yeah. Like, on a website, on a homepage, uh, I'm not going to be like sharing products and services, right? I'm just going to greet you, right? Like you're entering the, you're entering I guess my virtual home, right? Opposed to entering my sales funnel. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Like mm -hmm. that would be so disrespectful this, you know, to not even greet you, but mm -hmm. to say like, Hey, buy this or, you know, sign up for this, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's interesting too, when you've created the community around health casters and you're really focusing on those in the health and wellness world. And, you know, I have in my own work and helping around marketing and all these different copywriting work I've been doing for so long, there's that sense of, but it's different for us, yeah. but we need to remember, we always need to connect, to connect human to human. We're not selling widgets. We're yeah. offering up a platform for transformation. And we are, we are the thing. We're the, we're the vessel, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the, the service is coming through us. We are the service. Right. So, you know, to connect to the human, as you're saying, Melvin, to connect to you, like that's, without that, there is no service. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think another way of just looking, uh, I dare to think of it is uh, like that idea of services. I'm just trying to do, like, I'm just a conduit, you know? I'm just a vessel, like I'm, doing something that's much bigger than me and I'm just that that vessel you know 
Um, well, you know, when I think of you, Melvin, the word humility in one of its most beautiful forms is very much synonymous for me with Melvin. Mm-hmm. And just when I first encountered you being on your podcast a year ago and just the sound of your voice, it transmits that. And that is immensely comforting and it gives the people around you permission to really step into their own humanity and their humility. You know, it's, uh, no, thank you for saying that. I just, uh, I struggle with that a lot, you know, because I think I do genuinely try to just be myself, but then sometimes I'm like, oh man, are people going to think I'm like being an authentic or, you know, uh, but I don't know. I just try to be, I guess I just try to be human. You know, I don't, I don't have it all figured out and, uh, I don't think any of us do. And I'm just, I think part of it for me has just been giving myself permission to say, you know, like it's okay to not know everything, you know, even in the podcasting space, like I've definitely made my fair share of mistakes along the way. And, but it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. And, uh, just trying to figure it out, you know, and I think it gets more and more challenging when there's more eyes on you. I mean, as you're at that 18,000 downloads a month, it's sitting with what <laughs> authenticity and what humility really are. When in fact, you know, you're the same guy you were two years ago, picking up the mic for the first time. You know that. Mm-hmm. And the, the goal is to keep offering that to people and, and trust that they'll see that, you know, this isn't an act you're putting on as you're becoming bigger. Right. I think this is that struggle with fame. A lot of people end up with. Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, truth be told, I, I struggle with that fame aspect because I Mm. didn't launch, I didn't launch selling the couch to, to, you know, like have all these listeners and to be recognized as this person. And, and it is a weird feeling. I think when, you know, someone that knows you, but you've never met them and they greet you and, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, and how do you sort of stay, keep your, your, you know, your humanity? And, uh, it is weird because internally I feel like, oh my gosh. And this, I think is the battle. Like, how do I keep who I am versus this part of you, the human side, which, um, we're naturally drawn like by pride. Right. And how do you Mm -hmm. sort of say, you know what, that's, I don't know. I don't know if I'm like articulating it, but as something grows, how do you keep, how do you stay true to who you are and how do you not let that thing, which you're growing change you? And, and how do you just like, how do you hold that space Mm -hmm. to know where, where you stand, to know what your truth is? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, have you had any like moments of ahas around that? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> plenty. <laughs> this, this seems to happen on a daily basis, guys. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a couple of, I have had a lot of insights around that. I, I think I've, I've done a couple of practical things. Uh, one, I, you know, like my faith is really important in my life. So I have intentional time that I set aside in the mornings and in the evenings for quiet time. Um, just so that I can get grounded and just feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself, right? Um, I think the other thing is just having f- just friends and family that will be real with me and that would just see me as me, you know? Uh, I play lots of, and I have, you know, I play lots of basketball, so at least twice a week I'm running full court games. And those guys, they just know me as, you know, Melvin who plays basketball, right? Like, right. And that's a, that's a nice feeling. Um, so to have um, those places where you can root in and just, there's no other expectation of you showing up in another way. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and then I've got just um, a wonderful group of other guys that I just think hold me accountable and, and hold me in check and tell me like if I'm kind of going off course because, yeah, I mean, I think it's what we're talking about. I think impact and influence and all of these things can change people and I at least wanted people in my life. That was actually one of the things I did. I, I set up some accountability, like people that I trusted. Uh, when Sandy the Couch was first growing, I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I just need you to hold me in check because all of this is unfamiliar to me. Um, and I know myself to know that 
this could impact me in a way that's, you know, where I let this go way too much to my head and I just need you to hold me in check. Um, what yeah. kind of things did you want them to hold you in check around if that's not too personal a question? Yeah, of course. Um, I think one is like the, the pride aspect of it, yeah. right? Like saying, uh, just almost feeling like I'm now too good, right? To send an email or respond to an email or a private message, or when someone sees me at a conference or something, uh, just kind of ignoring them or, you know, uh, how do I still like, so things like that. I, yeah. I think that's probably like the most like practical. Cause I, I think for me right now, I think pride is the biggest thing so, I would probably yeah. struggle with. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think the other thing is like income. I never, I never started selling the couch to like create income, even though I, I teach you guys to think a lot about monetization. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's a weird space, I think. Not that, you know, like making crazy income or something, but it is more income than I've ever made, you know? And I think, and, and money is such an interesting thing, right? Because in some ways it's just a piece of paper, right? But in other ways, um, there's there's just a lot of stuff around power and insecurity and all of this stuff that comes up. So how do I, I think one of the things I've just been really trying to wrestle with is as my income and influence grows, how do I still stay grounded, you know? And I think a lot of what I've tried to do is I never, I knew for the longest time that um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't listen to that voice for a long time, but I knew that, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur just to create income. Um, I actually wanted to do it because um, I wanted it to come from um, like a place, like I wanted to do social entrepreneurship. So not just being an entrepreneur to create income, but being an entrepreneur and using your influence to do more good in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for me, it's like that's been some of the things, you know, like ending human trafficking and providing education to kiddos who wouldn't a have access to it. I think those are two big things that are, you know, that are, I'm very passionate about. And I think trying to do things around charitable giving and, and public and private support around that. Um, I think stuff like that keeps me kind of grounded. You know, I just want to bow to that and because Rebecca and I had one of those like hands in our heart moments. So I just want to, for those, those who cannot watch at home, um, but I also want to kind of circle around and, and, and bring this into that idea of, of personal branding, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot of what we're talking about with this idea of, hi, I'm Melvin, and what that means, what it meant two years ago, what it means now when someone looks at your website, when they meet you at a conference. Um, because Rebecca and I have been in a lot of conversations about what that is going to mean to our consulting clients, to those in our communities, to, to therapists and healers in general who are discovering who they are and what they stand for in order to be the best possible practitioners, in order to be the best possible human versions of themselves, but also in order to get their message out there and to present themselves in a certain way. And it comes back to this idea of essentially it's personal branding, which is another one of those phrases I think we kind of can sometimes move our shoulders around and shrug and not know exactly how we feel about that. Yeah. But because I think it's, it, it opens up all of the difficulties you're talking about in terms of opening us up to pride or whatever our shadows are. And yet we also know it's what we do as contemporary entrepreneurs in a digital space who are trying to differentiate ourselves and speak to our ideal, ideal clients who really need the services we offer. Yeah, no, I, 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 so I love studying stuff like branding and all of that stuff. Like I love reading about it, but like, I think what I keep coming back to is I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. It's what you guys said. Like I, I really do think things like that is things like branding ultimately it comes down to relationships and ultimately it comes down to is what I'm sharing, is it authentic to me and does it protect and does it take care of the person that's consuming our content? Mm -hmm. Protect and take care. I like that's that. That's such a way of being attuned to yeah, I'm a yeah. I, I'm an INFJ on my Myers Briggs. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking to our community because I, I haven't taken the Myers Briggs in quite a while, and I don't remember what I was. But 
I love talking to this community because so many of us just kind of are like, oh, I'm, <laughs> we classify ourselves mm. so quickly. And I think this goes back to branding a little bit mm. because it's not just us who classifies ourselves, but if, you know, Jonathan Fields talked about this at Camp GLP last summer, mm. that if, if we don't do a pretty good job of putting ourselves in a box and telling other people who we are and what we do, they're going to do it for us and they're not always going to get it right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And we lose our identity, I think, in some ways in the process. Yeah. Yeah. So, so much of, I mean, part of what I'm, what I'm taking away already from this conversation is how identity and brand and authenticity and insecurity and uncertainty, like how all of these things kind of get meshed up in this, in this story. Don't forget courage and humility. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Courage and humility definitely fall in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it is. I think it's a combination. And I think the other side of that is, uh, I think the the amount of transparency, right, we show ourselves online, I think that can vary for each person, right? Like, yes. uh, for, you know, like for you guys and I, like we may have different levels and that's okay. You know, I think for a long time I was like, oh, you know, uh, Pat Flynn at Smart Passive Income, I... He's been such a, a a big role model for me, um, not just because uh, of, of the popularity of his blog, but because he's built this business focused on his family and focused on service, right? But um, I can't be Pat Flynn, and I think for a long time I tried to be Pat Flynn, but you know I couldn't, right? But and that's okay, and I think part of that is just giving yourself permission to say, this is me and this is the way that I'm showing up now. It may not be this way forever, but this is what works now. Yes. This permission just to see yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we often, Maurice and I often talk about the practice of being seen and we say that you can't, other people can't see you until you can see yourself. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of that, too, is we talk a lot about being in the transformation business and holding space for others' transformation. But we also need to remember to give ourselves permission to leave room for our own transformation. Mm -hmm. Because that's, I mean, when we start to become a brand, there's that real risk of saying, okay, I need to calcify myself in this specific place because this is who I said I was, and I picked all the colors, and I have all the logo, and I made the website. <gasps> but wait. I'm going to evolve. I'm going to change. I'm going to transform. Can I give myself permission to do that? And the trust that says my business can grow with me, it can shift with me. There are other options out there. Yeah, I think uh, I like to think of it as like holding a position loosely, you know. Mm. Uh, and I think that's just, that's like one key lesson I, I've learned and I feel like continue to learn is that uh, I mean, the ideas that I have, you know, one moment are likely going to evolve. Like, practical example, selling the couch was originally supposed to be a multi-day uh, podcast. Uh, I think twice a week was the original plan. And one week I would, or one, one day of the week, I would teach some sort of concept. And then the second one, I would do some kind of an interview. And I, I went into that and then I was like, you know, I listened to my listeners and they were like, you know, twice a week sounds too overwhelming. So, and it was kind of overwhelming for me. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, so I went to once a week and, you know, I, I just think, but all of that to say, like, if I didn't start and just say, you know what, I'm going to throw something out there. Right. Uh, and let this evolve and hold right. this loosely, then none of it actually gets ever started. You got to throw the pasta at the ceiling and see what sticks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that image. <laughs> yeah, but you know, when people actually do that, mm -hmm. like I remember going to visit some guy's dorm room in London, actually studying abroad, and we looked up in the kitchen and the entire ceiling was covered in pasta. <laughs> <laughs> they actually did it. They literally did this? <laughs> they totally did. And that's one of my main memories of London. We shouldn't talk about my sunroom. So oh. <laughs> we, we have a spot in my sunroom where 
my kids can can mold and and get some um, some molding clay really nice and warm in their hands, mm. and then there's a spot where we let them throw it up and see if it sticks to the ceiling, mm. and if they get it just the right temperature and they throw it with just the right velocity, it actually does stick. And so there's a spot on my ceiling that has a whole bunch of pieces of little clay. <laughs> You're teaching <laughs> physics. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's really neat. <laughs> Oh, this has been such a delicious conversation today, Melvin. Thank you so much for joining with us. Oh, you're so welcome. I, I, this was so, in a good way, this is so different than, you know, the typical podcast conversation I have, which is usually around podcasting. But I was like <laughs> looking forward to this because it's just, this is a side I think of uh, myself I don't usually get to share. And, Honestly, probably two years ago, I would have not shared this much, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think people evolve and, and you step into things and I'm, I'm grateful that you guys gave me the opportunity. We are so honored to have held this space with you and humbled that you have shared so much with us and our listeners. And I think you've really touched a lot of hearts. I know you've certainly touched mine today. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So Melvin, where can people find more about you and your work and the ways you're of service to this world? Absolutely. Uh, well, my private practice website is at melvinvergeese.com. And then you can find me also on the Selling the Couch blog at sellingthecouch.com. And we'll include both of those links in our show notes. So thank you, Melvin, for being with us. And thank you, dear listeners. We want to remind you that if you want to dive deeper into the practice of being seen, we have a retreat coming up this August in New York's gorgeous Catskill Mountains. Learn more at practiceofbeingseen.com slash events. And I just want to hop in and add one more comment to that. Just that so much of what we're going to be offering at our retreat is a space to really sense, birth, and hold all of these different aspects of the visions and the dreams that you're looking to bring into the world. Yeah. And so on that note, for more great content, check out practiceofbeingseen.com and spread the word by subscribing, rating, and reviewing our podcast. Music written and performed by Christopher Ferris and produced at Kidneystone Studio. <laughs>